let me say actually something about safety first and, and then get to innovation because actually the safety revolution in Chinese air travel is a really interesting metaphor for the soul of China and the future of China. Also for U.S.-China relations, yes, I should say. Yes, exactly. And because, again, China, um, Chinese air travel in the olden days was really grossly unsafe. It was on a par with African Airlines now or Burma Air back in the, back in the olden days. And it was partly the planes were bad, partly the navigation was, was really terrible, and partly the governance of the whole system. As you all know, the CAAC, the Chinese uh, uh, sort of uh, aerospace monopoly, used to build airplanes, run airlines, sell tickets, train pilots, test pilots, do safety inspections. Which has the unfortunate <laughs> uh, acronymic uh, sound of CAC. Yes. <laughs> yes, that's why I always say it, CAC, but it's, it's now, now uh, phased out. And so because uh, there was one dramatic moment I described where a China, one Chinese airline got a new uh, route to fly into Los Angeles, when its plane arrived, the FAA was over it with about 100 safety violations, said, no, this isn't going to happen anymore. You can't fly here anymore. This till this gets cleaned up. The airline dealt with Boeing and said, we're going to have trouble buying your airplanes if we can't fly them to the United States. So Boeing midwifed this incredible interpenetration of American officials, both public and private, with their Chinese counterparts to change the entire fabric of how Chinese did, uh, China did this, and uh, describe uh, this man, Joe T, who's a Boeing person who's essentially become Chinese, teaching them, for example, you can't have Czech pilots doing the Czech ride for their brother-in-law or for their son or something. You need to have some kind of separation and checks and balance. And they got procedures going. Uh, there's a wonderful book called China Takes Off by a man named E.E. E. Bauer, who was a Boeing representative, the first one in the, uh, in the 70s. And he talks about how Boeing would have these standards for, like, fuel filters. They had to be replaced every so many hours of operation because otherwise the engines would be destroyed. The Chinese mechanics would look at them, wash them out, say they look okay, plug them back in, and the engines would just blow up because, you know, because they, were, uh, the, they looked clean, but the microparticles were getting through. So the procedural change in China, making it a modern, international, liberal society, has been, it's impressive that, Boeing and the FAA and United made it happen. It's also impressive that China let it happen and has embraced it. And so if you wanted a metaphor for three branches of government, U.S., China, and Boeing, uh, working together and actually transforming China in a way that one aspires to in other forms, uh, this, this and maybe some other analogs in, in uh, food safety or in, in clean energy, as you well know, there are some promising signs there. Yeah, two kinds of effect, two, two kinds of interaction actually ha have had an effect. One is this unconscious soft power of the people who have been in the United States and they might, like you or me, find a lot to object to in the United States. A lot of people here they don't like, a lot of things they seem cr they think crass or untraditional, but they recognize the basic values of the society, its basic openness, which to me is the only thing that really matters about the United States. We keep, uh, our, our idea is continued <coughs> absorption, and, and that can make an impression on people. And so, for example, I think it's a lot easier for Americans and, and Westerners in general to deal with Chinese financial officials and technical officials because most of them have been trained here than it is with political officials or military officials. So that would be one <coughs> test case. The other is at all the levels below the very top level negotiations. That is, if you took the strategic and economic dialogues and ignored the Secretary of State, Secretary Treasury part and talked about the Energy Department, um, you know, coal programs or the EPA programs or the FDA programs, I think those institutional second and third tier um, interactions have had some success, and actually I've documented one mm -hmm. where people don't die in Chinese airlines anymore uh, because, mainly because of this U.S.-Chinese interaction, which, final point, the Americans are always careful to say they're bringing international standards to China, not American practices, because mm -hmm. that is an entirely face-saving way to absorb it. I admire Japan. I think of it like being inside a watch where it's very, very closely machined, where it's China. It's like being in some gigantic scrum. Uh, just, you know, it's like being inside a Bruegel painting. Did There's you, you feel everything. more absorbable in China? Yes. I, I, I felt China was a much more permeable society. There are things 
I, I am uh, relatively much better in Japanese language than Chinese language, but somehow I could deal more easily with Chinese people. Chinese people welcomed you. Here would be, I'll give two parables. I would say the language attitude in, Jap in Japanese, unless you're really perfect, which is kind of this French sense of, well, as a foreigner, you couldn't speak uh, Japanese, where in China, it's like the American attitude. You should be speaking the local language and you know all sort of approximations. At your level, they may have more refinement, but I I'm sort of in the role of a, of a hot dog vendor, you know, <laughs> trying to communicate my, my pigeon Chinese, and people would, would try, try to work with me. I also have an aviation analogy in the book. I flew a plane with a friend from Japan and into China, when the plane was being fueled in Japan, uh, they had two people wearing identical outfits, safety helmets, safety instructions, and little placards. They put a protective cuff around the fueling vent. You've seen the plane being fueled. And after fueling it, they bowed to the plane, they bowed to us. When we fueled up this plane in China, we couldn't find any gas to begin with. We had to siphon it out of some Russian uh, trainers. <laughs> and then to fuel it, there was this 55 gallon drum that was up on a on a uh, you know truck on the back of a truck and some poor guy had to siphon it out with his mouth into the, the vent and it w everybody was laughing at him so the mor the moral was in Japan there is the way to do things in China people find a way to do things mm -hmm. and I think China finds a way to do things even when controlled or prohibited